And now, weighing in out of the blue corner, Josh the Pong Thompson. 100% agree. And on the other mic, he weighs in from the red corner, Big John McCarthy. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am absolutely enthralled, happy, ecstatic. I don't know any other way to say it. I've got a guy who's just as old as me on the other <laughs> side of this thing, almost. I have known this man forever. He is absolutely a legend when it comes to the sport of MMA, the trainer of all of the champions that you look at and you go, yep, that guy probably belongs on that Mount Rushmore. Well, you belong on the Mount Rushmore of trainers. My man, Greg Jackson, how you doing? I'm well. Thank you for the kind words. None of it's true, but thank you for the kind it's words. It's all to do. They, no, they no, call you Yoda for a reason. You're, you're, you're old. The, old part, <laughs> the, old <part. laughs> the two of you guys being, yeah, the two of you guys are really old. Yeah. I, well, you guys, what? Looking, uh, what, about 82, 83, both of you? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, about that. Yeah. Inside. Yeah. 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 You, you, I, I've noticed the difference. You both got the gray in the same spots. But more that's missing knowledge. a little bit up here there, that's, Greg. That's knowledge. You're missing, my, huh? Yeah, I, I, my, my hair left me a long time ago. We had it falling out. It was just one of those things that happens, you know? You, guys, <laughs> you guys parted ways? <laughs> <laughs> I'm fired today. I keep telling people, man, it's not hair loss. It's just facial gain. You'll just be all forehead pretty soon. <laughs> okay, I'm stealing. It's hard to cover up, you know, a solar panel. And when you're, just, right. yeah. you're doing it like Greg all the time, it's you, know, you got to keep that panel up there so the sun shines in. Hey, Greg, do me a favor. I think you're cut your hands covering the microphone because I can't, I can barely, you sound really muffled. How's that better? There you go. Oh, way my better. God. Way better. Okay. Yes. And was covering the microphone. Yeah. You just got me here. I'm the, I'm the brains of this operation, obviously. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God. Uh, okay, look, how are things in uh, in Albuquerque? How, how's the how's the gym doing? I mean, any young talent coming up we should keep an eye on? What's 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 going on in your world? Uh, gym is copacetic. We got some good up and comers. Aaron Pico, who you guys know well, oh, um, oh, yeah, he's awesome. Comers. We've got uh, John's fight around the corner with Stipe, so we've been really hitting that hard. Um, and yeah, we've got a lot of uh, a lot of great talent as usual, and it's I'm having a lot of fun. So same old. When, when you look at, you know, the people that you have been able to work with as a trainer, and when I sit, sit there and say, Robert, you've got John Jones, who's considerably, no doubt, the most talented MMA fighter there's ever been. The guy who's got an incredible record, has fought so many championship rounds. It's incredible. You had George St. Pierre was, you know, in your stable. You take a look at the people that you've had, and – Guys like Rashad Evans, who you know came to you and things like that. What was it? Because all of them seem to you know come to Albuquerque, and they fell in love with you. I know that. But what 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 was it when you looked at these guys? When you what was it? That, is there anything that makes them all look? They all have this, and that's why they're the fighters that they were. That's a great question. Um, and I don't know if it's a tangible, like if there's one, like this is the this is the the uh, value or this is the what the person brings to the table because they're also different. I yeah. think that um, they all were great fighters, super physically talented, um, but just intelligent, like all smart, sharp people. I, and I, I think that that's a. Uh, as I get older, that seems to be one of the more deciding factors is how they run their camps and their life and their that kind of thing. Um, you have to have that talent, but they're all, I would all say that all those guys are very smart. The way they do stuff as far as fighting is concerned, they're very smart. Um, you know, it's, the extracurriculars, maybe not as smart, but <laughs> <laughs> fighting definitely smart. That's it. What? What made them individually? Let's I'll just take one at a time so we don't just people don't brush over individuals. Uh, but one GSP, what made him special to you? What made him unique to you? Well, what I loved about GSP is that, like, for me, there's sometimes there's just fighters, and fighters are, as we all know, just they're fighters. Like, you they wake up in the morning, whatever tools you're going to give them, they're going to use to win the fight and, and do what they do. Um, and there's martial artists who are more like, I'm sorry, I'm doing the cover again. Martial artists seem to be more like, um, you know, they, fighting is an element of what they do sometimes, but a lot of it's just self-improvement, yada, 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 all the other things that the martial arts give you. George was like a, 
guy that combined those two extremely well. He was an amazing fighter, super competitive, stepped up under pressure, but at the same time just loved martial arts and loved the martial arts lifestyle. So I think he was one of the special guys that really embraced kind of the, uh, I wouldn't say traditional martial art values, but like a lot of that old school martial art mentality stuff. He's a sweetheart of a guy, usually didn't say bad stuff about his opponent, that kind of a thing, like old school martial arts. More, more of that than an entertainer, if that makes sense. Whereas like a lot of fighters are more entertainers than they are martial artists. And sometimes you get all three. But uh, George, in my opinion, I think was that, was much more of a... Uh, uh, a guy that could blend the martial arts and that lifestyle in with combat. And that's always, a lot of times that's not always the case. If you're looking to do MMA bets, there is no one better than bet us. I'm telling you right now, they are fantastic. The odds are great. And right now, if you use our promo code of YouTube 150, you will get 150% on top of what you put in up to $2,000 and if you do it and you add more money later on, it's 125%. So they even add on top of it. BetUS is the very best when it comes to MMA gambling. If you want to make a bet on a fight, you know a fighter is going to win. I'm telling you right now, go to BetUS, use that code YouTube150, and you'll get that 150% on top of what you put down. You can also use them for NFL, NBA, any of the sports that are available on BetUS. YouTube 150 is your promo code. 150% bonus on your first deposit. 125% bonus on your next two deposits. Don't miss out. Go to BetUS. It's crazy. Like after a fight, you use GSP and say, yeah, I'm going to go back to my room with some friends. You knew he was going to go back to his room with his friends. He wasn't going to go to the strip club. He wasn't going to go to the... To the you know John Jones no. though okay, <laughs> different different lifestyle well, that's all right. different lifestyle but what made outside of all the other stuff for John Jones what made John Jones unique inside what? the cage or at the gym or whatever John is like an animal of creativity like what he does is he studies and trains so hard that his creativity is always just a stone's throw away, so to speak. In other words, he'll do the move or the situation 10,000 times so that when he gets to the situation, he's done it so many times that it gives him uh, the mental space to be creative within those parameters. So if he is trained to you know, push you up against the fence, whatever, and do a certain takedown or whatever, he's done that so many times that when he actually gets there in the fight, he's comfortable there and he can kind of relax a little bit and say, okay, well now I can do this and I can do that. And um, so for me, it was always his creativity. Like half the time he was in there, we would have, with his style of fighting, we would have a generalized game plan. These are the, the kind of the target things you have to hit. But how you get there, I, I was never super specific about once it was fight for the actual game plan going up. Yeah, okay, you know, do an underhook on this side, trap that leg, blah, blah, blah. But I knew that when he got there, he might do that or he might do a version of it or something more creative because he had been there so many times so he could problem solve extremely well. So I always love that about John is his ability to problem solve because he did the work on the front end. He would just watch hours and hours and hours of tape on his opponent. Um, he would constantly get in the positions that his opponents would put people in. And when he did that well, when he was really focused, that's when he's the most dangerous for sure. With him, though, I've noticed that creativity is not what it was when he was fighting guys like Shogun, who uh, he's fighting other guys. Like, is it because of the age? Is he still that way in the gym? Is he still trying to be creative? Because if you look at his fights with like Dominic Reyes and and uh, and other guys at Santos, there wasn't as much creativity in those fights as he as there was with guys when he was younger. Are we still well, I would see the age get not get to him, but he should. Yeah, I, sometimes you just have bad fights because yeah, certainly. True. Certainly, his last fight uh, inside slipping to a takedown to a guillotine choke over the top of uh, of Gon's uh, yeah. defense. I thought that was eminently creative. I I didn't even see that coming. Oh, it was fantastic! But I didn't see that guillotine coming from that position. We had to again. You elevate your head over their head. You get him in a position, and then he was very creative on that. So I think sometimes right. you have off fights, man. I mean, it's a and and Josh. I know you never had an off fight, but yeah, normal being. <laughs> sometimes have off fights and i uh, and that's just the way it is so you have a fight or two where you're like ah you just don't uh you don't feel it and it had happened earlier um i felt that way with um osp too when we fought him uh that yeah 
we weren't being as creative as we needed to be. And so we try to make adjustments and, and fix those problems. But uh, yeah, certainly I think that uh, when John studies, takes it seriously and focuses, he's a dangerous individual. Now well, I'm going to, I'm going to, oh, sorry, Johnny, I have one more fighter. I want to chat with, with Holly ahead. home, with Holly home. Now she, cause I have to bring her into this. Like mm -hmm. I feel like she gets left on the outside too much. She has been amazing and to see what she's done in such a short period of time in the sport. She came in late to the sport. I know she was in combat sports before, but coming in late to the sport of MMA, having the success that she did, she gets, she doesn't get talked about enough in what she's done in the sport. She seems like an absolute amazing person. I was cutting weight with her at one of my fights. Fantastic, fantastic person. But what makes her unique though in your gym? So she is definitely one of the mentally just toughest humans I have ever met. Um, she's the person that comes back into the corner and this has actually happened. And she goes, coach, I think my arm's broken. And I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, well, do you want to, are we going to go? She's like, yeah. And you go down and with that and like hits the girl with the arm that's broken that like, I just, yeah. and then at the end of the night, everyone's trying to like mansplain her like, oh, I'm sure it's not that bad. And I'm like, if Holly is saying she's in pain, she needs to be <laughs> right. Sure enough, like shattered in half, not broken like a little. My, I mean, her arm was shattered in half, and she fought yeah. half more rounds with that thing. Yeah. So, just unbelievably mentally tough, sweet, kind, just everything that's good about people. She is, um, yeah. and and just such a worker. Like, so let's say we go and we run on the Sandia Crest, which is in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where I'm at. It's a, a tall mountain. It's like ten thousand, ten some change. So we run in around on that thing. It will all do, let's say we do 50 sprints at the top. She will then make sure she runs home. Where the rest of us are like cool down and kind of jog, walk home. She full speeds runs back to the car. Like that's who she is. Like just always one more super tough, like just a phenomenal person. And she elevates the whole team because as you guys know that when you have somebody that tough, everybody else tries to rise to meet that standard. And so she's such a, an important part of the gym for that in that she sets the culture there of like, well, you, if you've got a broken arm, you're still got to fight. Um, leader by leader by action. She, exactly. she leads by example for sure. Exactly. So I, I think that's one of the things that makes her so great. It's just that she's just insanely mentally tough. You talked about, you know, John's got his fight coming up in November and many people have speculated because he's, he's kind of led it that way. Of, this might be his last fight. Do you honestly think this is going to be his last fight or is he kind of in that position? Like, I could fight again if <laughs> the numbers are right. <laughs> I'm sure that, listen, I'm sure if you paid John enough, he would fight anybody anytime. Um, <laughs> That's the way I looked at it. Right. I was going to say who wouldn't. Right. But uh, yeah. the, um, uh, <clears throat> I, as of right now, I think this is the last one. But again, if if uh, if the fans demand it and Dana pays him the money, I'm sure he'd be down to fight Aspinall or whoever else is some phenomenal heavyweights right now. It's the, it's it seems to be kind of another golden era uh, coming up. I'm hoping anyway in that heavyweight division with such good talent up there. Well, I'm telling you right now, when I am outside working and it is blazing hot. The thing that has saved my life this summer is Element. I love Element as a product. We're talking about a product that puts electrolytes, magnesium, and salt back in your system so you can function at your very best. When we're talking about salt, a lot of people think it's not good for you. Well, that has been proven wrong. It is absolutely something you need. And the best part about Element is they use salt in a way that it actually tastes good. Stay salty, my friend, is a great line. And it's the absolute truth when it comes to Element as a drink. John uses Element out there on the farms. I give it to my kids when they're out there playing sports. Like my son, he's super active in lacrosse as well as soccer. It's good to give it to the kids, keep their bodies hydrated, keep their muscles hydrated. The sodium is good for them, especially in this hot weather here in Texas, as well as for you out there in Tennessee. But hey, if you guys have athletes in your family, make sure you keep them hydrated by using Element. Use our description down below. Use the link, sorry, in the descriptions down below. Yeah. Make sure you hit that link. And every purchase you guys make through our link, they'll send you a bonus product. Uh, That's what's so important, man. You got to use that link because you'll get extra product. It's free. You're getting freebies. Exactly. So make sure you guys use our link down below in the descriptions for that bonus package of product. Every purchase you guys make. Well, when you, when you look at John at 205, I mean, his reach, his length, everything about him was just so astronomical compared to other guys in that division. And you look at him at heavyweight, and we've only seen him the one time. 
you know, it was a quick fight. You know, he disposed of Cyril Gaon easily. When you see him in the gym, what differences do you see in him as a heavyweight compared to when he was a light heavyweight? You know, I, I think everybody tries to bring in a lot of space. Like I've heard, oh, he's slower. He's slower now. And I'm like, mm. John was never like, you never watched the John Jones fight and said, that was the fastest human being I've ever seen fight. You That's know, right. but the thing. Um, he's not especially quick. He's very strong, but you know, I'm sure there's people that are stronger than he is. There's not a lot of differences that I'm seeing other than he is bigger and stronger. Speed wise, uh, it's about the same. If not, honestly, I was just watching him spar last night. He might be a little quicker at heavyweight. I'm just saying, we'll, we'll see you in this next time. Um, but uh, so there's that. Um, the the real thing is is how we train is has evolved because he's older now. So as a heavyweight, we're a little more you know uh, organized as making sure that we do certain things to meet the standard to them so we can spar so we don't get injured. Um, so we're, we have organized things a little bit more, not because of his heavyweight, but because of the age factor. Um, he's still relatively young, you know, 38, but, um, for us, for John and I, that's very young. Yeah. That's super you do. That's <laughs> his fighter. Grand, great. Almost have grandchildren that age. Uh, yes. <laughs> what, what is the itch for him though? And really wanting to get this steep Bay fight and not so much wanting to fight, say like a Tom Aspinall or Curtis blades or some, what, what about the steep Bay fight is really kind of driving him? Well, I think it's that Stipe is so legendary. I mean, the guy's one of the best heavyweights. I mean, you could argue he's one of the best heavyweights ever. Um, so I think that's the challenge that John needs. Because there's always going to be young guys coming up. There's always going to be a new phenom. There's always going to be another guy that's like, oh, this guy's super tough. So I think the 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 attraction with John on that is it's really two legends fighting each other. And he wants, yeah, at this point in John's career, he doesn't need to fight, right? He could, he could yeah. stop today and be fine. Um, but I think that gets him up steep. The idea of Stipe and how great he is and how tough he is and to compete against that. Um, I think he's looking for like a legacy thing there. Be my opinion. We've seen that with a lot of fighters. Dustin Poy has come out and said it a couple of times. Some other fighters that we've had on the, on the show recently have talked about it. They're looking for the fights. And when you get to this age, you're looking for that fight that the fighter or the fights that motivate you the most. Right. And I, I can see why, like, like people were criticizing him for not fighting Tom Aspinall. Sure, I, for selfish reasons, I'd love to see that fight. But let's be honest, he doesn't need to fight Tom Aspinall. He doesn't need that fight. He can move on with his life just fine, and his career will be, his legacy will be just fine. No, right. that he didn't fight Tom Aspinall. Yeah. Right, and and maybe he will. I don't know, honestly. Yeah. Um, but I do know that we had this fight locked up before any of that drama all happened. So, yeah. uh, like, it would be, to me, it would be uh, a terrible move to tell Stipe, oh, never mind, we're not going to fight you after all. We're going to go after this guy. I mean... Stipe deserves better than that. He's a, he's not only a, a great fighter, but he's a great guy too. So yeah, we wouldn't be doing anything like that. When you look at Stipe, what are the, what are the things that you guys, when you guys break him down, what are the things that you feel like John may have to be not concerned about, but things that you guys have been kind of preparing for? Like, Hey, Stipe is good at this. He's good at covering <laughs> distance. He's good at. Yeah. He's really good at everything. But what really impresses me about Stipe, first of all, I mean, in MMA today, as you guys know, you have to be so good at everything. Um, but what really impresses me about Stipe is how layered his defense is. And what I mean by that is, like, you could rock him. That doesn't mean that you're going to win. You can put him into submission hold. That doesn't mean you're going to win. Like, the guy has the dog in him. Like, he just will fight out of any and everything. And if you give him any kind of space, he is going to fight hard. Um, and that's not always the case. Like, sometimes when you get into a competitive space that has a way out, when you're losing, you can be like, okay, the referee's going to save me, that kind of a thing. That none of that's in Stipe's vocabulary. Like he, 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 it's like a street fight. Like he is going to fight until he cannot walk or he is not conscious. Um, and so I have a ton of respect for that. And I think that's one of the main things that you have to worry about a guy like that is when you get him in trouble, you've got to be disciplined. It was actually reminds me a lot of one of your old teammates, John Fitch, who has that, mm. Fitch, just that. Like, I remember Fish would just tempt you into guillotines and stuff, and you'd watch all these guys just burn out trying to choke yep. up everything they had, and then he'd pop up and be like, okay, my turn. Yeah. Decimate no, people. Yeah, it was something even in training him. He just constantly was, go ahead, keep going, keep going. <laughs> in round two, though, when I when the break, when there's a break, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you pay for it when you can't punch anymore. And you right. You can't defend takedowns. 
Right. You see a lot of the a lot of that fighting mentality in, in Stipe too, where he's he's got great hands, you know, he's got a great he's got good takedowns, he's got good ground and pound, he's got good counter wrestling, he's got good wrestling. Um but I think what makes him one of the things that makes him great is that dog in him. Yeah. Let's talk about you for a minute here. Oh stop. What, what come on, what 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 was it that led you to the martial arts? When was it that you started your Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and what led you into the realm of coaching was it opening your gym that just you were you had a gym and then it was about you know in that time everyone had little gyms and fighters came out of those gyms it was wasn't like the the mega gyms that we have now but what was it that got you interested in the martial arts and what sent you in that direction okay so that i uh, i was i uh, my parents are both from chicago area um but they were hippies and so they kind of wanted to go into something different and like hippie hippies um <laughs> so they went to santa fe Yes, exactly what happened. I went to Albuquerque. <laughs> My uncle had joined the Peace Corps. They followed him. They fell in love with New Mexico. Um, so they put me in uh, the South Valley of Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is one of the poorest places in the United States. We constantly compete with Mississippi and Louisiana for who's the uh, who's the poorest with the most problems. Uh, sometimes we win. Sometimes we're number two. You know, it's uh, it's an ongoing competition. Uh, so <laughs> is that winning? Is yeah, that really winning? Listen, Isn't time number two better? Us New Mexicans, we take it where we can get it. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so you put me there, and so uh, basically, I was only, the only white kid in a very Hispanic community, mm-hmm. and the Hispanic community also had a very machismo element to it, right? They were very like those kids. Were, I mean, they they were living lives where juvie was just part of it. Like nothing would you couldn't take anything away from them. Like if you put them in juvie, oh, they're getting three meals a day and their dad isn't getting drunk and kicking the crap out of them, right? So there's nothing you could take from those kids. Um, So I grew up in that as like a whole hard little little wet old white kid. And uh, so they didn't didn't respect anything. They didn't care if you played soccer. They didn't care if you were good in school. The only thing everybody cared about is who could kick whose butt. And so I was like, well, I better figure out how to do that so that I can actually have some self-respect. So pretty early on, I would say fifth grade, fifth grade, kindergarten i i met brad valdez and his family were all boxers and wrestlers and they kind of took me under their wing um the valdez family really kind of showed his brothers were all street fighters he was a street fighter so they they kind of educated me as to okay here's what's happening uh and then i just started hitting the ground running Uh, i was okay at it and uh it was nice to have respect and so i opened my school so i I was doing a lot of uh extracurricular stuff yeah. Open my school when I was open my school when I was seventeen of all like just a kid. I can't even believe I did that. Um, so I opened it when I was seventeen with no aspirations of being a coach. Like because again, where I was raised, it was rare that you fought one on one. I mean, sometimes you would have the one on one, but as soon as you started winning, all their friends would jump in, and then yeah. you're you're on that party. I feel like we grew up very similarly. <laughs> Yes, probably so. Except you're a great fighter and I'm me, but uh, I wasn't in fifth grade. <laughs> I can tell you that. I had a little bit of wrestling, but yeah, I feel like we grew up similarly. Yeah. Right. So I, I that kind of impetus, I, and the reason I opened the school is I was trying, my family, I come from wrestlers. So my brother took state in New Mexico. My dad took state in Chicago. My uncle took D2 nationals. Like I come from a long line of wrestling. Um, and so I would try other martial arts. And as you guys know, in the 80s and late 80s, especially, martial arts weren't exactly on the cutting edge of efficiency or what was working. So uh, I would always just go revert back to just basically wrestling around and punching. And But again, you can't do that when there's more than one guy. So then I would wrestle around and the people would kick you and you'd get up. So I tried to start figuring out stuff on my own because everywhere I went to to do a martial art, I'd be like, oh, this one's going to work. And then my, my parents, God bless them, they were like hippies. So they're like, oh, we need a peaceful martial art because my son is too violent. So they put me in Aikido of all freaking worthless yeah. Oh, you and Steven Seagal. I never knew you guys were related. Dude, we <laughs> are no brothers. Um, yeah. So meanwhile, I'm trying to like grab the wrists of these Hispanic boxers that are just lighting me up with jabs and stuff. Like, I got to grab your wrist and flip you over. Nope. <laughs> I was getting – anyway, so that, that quickly went to the wayside. But uh, just the idea that I had to figure it out myself – um, and so that's what I started doing. There was no Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in 92, 93. 
um, in Albuquerque of all places. So uh, we started, I didn't actually do, want to do competitions. I was just all about street stuff. Like that was the martial arts to me. Um, and my students, when the UFC came out in, what was it, 94? John, when was that, 94? November 12th, 1993. 93, there you go. See, I can't even. So then it would have been 94, 95, 94, I guess, that we started competing because they talked me into it. They were like, hey, they're starting to do all these, you know, uh, fights and, and we want to do them. And I was like, ah, just a stupid kid. You know, again, I'm 17, 18 years old. I don't know head my head from my ass. Not that I know it now, but I especially yeah. didn't then. So I was like, oh, dad's stupid competition. You know what I mean? Again, it didn't have any relevancy to the way I was raised. Um, and I just didn't, yeah, I never liked that kind of attention either. So I, anyway, uh, but they talked me into it and we started winning. We started doing the grappling tournaments. Uh, and as you guys know, in those days, until John wrote the rules, like you would show up and literally the internet was not really a thing. So you would show up and be like, okay, what are the rules? You can open hand it with a left hand, but you can punch him with the right. <laughs> but there were there were a lot of different ones. Yeah, they oh my changes. god! Yeah, so in those before we had any kind of a unified rule system, uh, it was it was the wild west. I mean, it really was. Wherever we went, it was just different rules all the time. Some of them were crazy, like basically no rules. Some of them were like like the shoot fighting in Texas and stuff was like open hand to the face. But Evan Tanner, he did very well with the, sh the yeah. shoot fighting in Texas. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So anyway, um, but that's where it all started. I got to, I never wanted to be a coach. I got talked into the whole thing. Um, and here we are 30 some odd years later. Yeah. Good life choices, huh? <laughs> Just man, I'm telling you, I was so lucky I got in early. I was so, so lucky. It was, uh, I don't know if I could, like, it, the schools are so competitive and there's so many of them now. I don't know if yeah. I can beat these days. <clears throat> the thing is, when you, you, you had GSP, you had John Jones, you got Rashad Evans, you had Carlos Condit. What was it like, though? Because now you had some, there was some, I don't know what you would call it. Not, there was no animosity between them. There was a little bit, I think, between Rashad and John because they were teammates. But what was it like as a coach having to deal with the John Jones, Evans, you know, Rashad Evans thing, and as well as Carlos Condit and GSP both kind of coming from your from your place? Right. Yeah, Where does that did. put you as a coach? You know, knowing that you you like all of them, it's I know it can't be easy. Well, and and that was a failure on my part. Is that I I didn't understand what mixed martial arts was. And to a degree, I, I still don't really understand it. And what I mean by that is mixed martial arts to me was a laboratory where you could like figure, try to do moves, figure out new game ideas. Like, you know what I mean? And then you have the immediate feedback. Like, nope, that didn't work. Never doing that again. Or, oh, that's might be something there. Or that worked for sure. So that's what I thought it was. And then like having a team of guys doing that was very tough. I didn't, the entertainment part of it just never, I'm just not that smart. Like it never entered into my brain. It, like what it really is, how it's a release for people that are, you know, have all this pent up rage and stuff to like, just let that out. And I'd rather be yelling at the TV than smacking their kids. Like all the, yeah. the, the, the other side of it just didn't, wasn't a reality to me. So I messed up. Can we cuss on this thing? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so I fucked up. If we, if we can, I'm in trouble. <laughs> so I, what I just didn't know, like, again, I'm still a kid. Like I'm in my twenties yeah. and my thirties. I just never thought that we'd end up fighting each other. Like it was never a thing where I'd be like, Oh, I need to put protocols in place. But after that Rashad and John situation, then I was like, all right, well, this is going to happen because we can't stand in the way of people's dreams. Right? Like no. you can't, we'll never fight each other, but there's a guy that's a champion and the other guy wants to fight him. So like when, with GSP and Carlos, I just step out of all of it. I just, I, I stepped out. Uh, the only time I didn't step out is when Andre fought Alistair Overeem. I was on in Andre's corner because I promised Andre that I would always. Anyway, um, but Alistair was very understanding about that. And Alistair and I are still friends to this day. But uh, um, I didn't. Usually I just step all the way out. I, I let the other coaches. They pick the other coaches. Mm -hmm. And I. Uh, um, that way I don't have, but we have protocols, you know, we have to say, okay, here's the way we do it. Your practice is at this time. The other person's practice is at that time. Um, we set all these things in place. So that was really, we didn't have a ton. I mean, there's always a little animosity and drama with that stuff, but it wasn't like the Rashad and uh, John one, man, that was just awful. And it was all my fault. Like, because I didn't have, I just never thought we'd be there. I like a Dumbo. So yeah, that was one of my, I've made so many mistakes in this game. Um, and that was one of my big ones. It was, uh, it was a real good life lesson. 
Hey, everyone, the Weighing In podcast was the very first podcast that ever had a relationship with OF. And our relationship was in trying to bring combat athletes and fans together. It has been working. We've got a ton of people who are on OF now, fighters that you can go, you can sign up with, you can ask them questions, you can look for techniques that they use. It is a fantastic system. If you are that person that wants that one-on-one interaction, OF is the easiest way for you to do it. Yeah, you guys, check out OnlyFans. Subscribe to us over there. It is free. We have continued our partnership with them, and we're going to be there for at least a couple more years. Well, that's the hopes. Ooh, yeah. And look, we're enjoying working with them. They are a great company in terms of also bringing other athletes on. They're working close with Formula One. They're working close with a lot of combat sports athletes. They just signed Billy Kemper. Billy Kemper is now on their platform. Also giving awesome surfer. Surfy, amazing surfer. Giving extra information. If both of you guys don't know the background on OnlyFans, OnlyFans was originally started for for sports, for yeah. soccer players, the European soccer market, having coaches being able to sell their information to their closest fans or people that really were driven to try to be the best. This is what it was produced for. That's what we're going to be trying to do. We're providing the extra content over on OnlyFans. Make sure you guys subscribe to us over there. It is free. There will be some stuff that we charge for, but right now our pro- our page and all the content we put on there is free. So subscribe to us over there at OnlyFans. Well, spoken like a true coach, though, right? Taking the blame for what happened. Uh, I mean, was, you know, you don't you can't blame with the fighters. Well, you gotta you gotta blame yourself. And that's that's spoken like a true leader. And that's that's what I think a lot of these fighters that went to you. That's what they were looking for. Someone to guide them, lead them, but also take responsibility for when they couldn't do it themselves. Good, yeah, good well, on you, coach. Good on you. Good on you. Good job, coach. <laughs> yeah, it happens, though. You know, I mean, no one saw it. We went through something similar at AKA. You had Koscheck, Fitch, Swick, uh, all vying for that title, you know, to fight GSP. And, you know, basically, Koss and Fitch were the ones that ended up getting there. G- uh, Swick didn't get there. But still, there was a little bit like, well, we're going to fight each other. We're not. But it was right. the title was on the line. You're changing that person's life if they win it. Right. You know what I mean? The, the, the substantial difference between making the money as a Financially, champion and making the money difference. as a, as not a contender is just a contender is completely different. But, <laughs> See, no one explained that to me. <laughs> that <wasn't> yeah. <laughs> that people don't realize that people don't realize the amount of money you make as the champion versus look, I could be the number one, number two, number three mm-hmm. contender, but I'm not making what the champion's making. And you shouldn't, but it still stays even after you're not champion. Sure. You take a little bit of a pay cut, but you're still making pretty good money knowing that yeah. you're a former champion because you're still marketable as a former champion. But well, the, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say it's a dream too. You know, there's like an intangible there where like I want to be the champion. That's why I got into this stuff. And you can't stand in the way of that from some for somebody. You can't. I wanted to kind of go because like you've had, like I said, GSP, John Jones, Rashad Evans, you know, tons of champions come to Carlos Condit. I mean, Holly Holm, like you've had all these world class fighters there. What? But they are kind of now coming towards the end or have already left the sport. What have you noticed between? the old guys and the new ones? That's a really good question. So there's really, I divided kind of into three, a generation of three. So my first generation before all the GSPs and all that, in the bare knuckle days, basically, um, they were just wild men. I mean, we had some good athletes, but really that generation, uh, they did a ton of drugs and they just, <laughs> I mean, put all the craziness. And they, because in those days there was no testing. Yeah. So you got these guys that were just juiced out of their minds and just wanted to fight. Like you pay them great, but you don't pay them. Like they're not, there was no money in it. Like you go and no. you win a tournament, like 300 bucks. So you're not oh, like, I know. <laughs> yeah, you were there. So I was there. <laughs> right. So that generation was just, I always just call them just straight savages. I mean, they were just like how they treated women, how they treat, you know what I mean? Like they were just, it was yeah. just a different generation. It was, uh, kind of the tail end of the boomers beginning of gen x stuff and and it was in in my opinion they were extremely mentally tough they didn't have we didn't have the knowledge base that we do now um because of them right they were helping us get it uh if they were just like i don't want to use the word toxic because not all of them were but man there was a lot of mental going on 
<laughs> so that's like that first generation. And I'm not above it. Like I'm right there with them. Like it's not saying like I grew up like us. We grew up fighting. That's what we did. So we had a lot of. Problems. So you're saying Big John's toxic because he came from that yeah, generation. Yeah, got yeah, it, got toxic it, got masculinity it. over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all right. So I'll, but, I'll, t- I'll take I'll take the compliment. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but because there's a lot of pluses to those kind of guys. Like they're those are the guys that you call at 3 a.m. and they will be at your door. They're the diehards. Exactly. And some of my dearest friends from uh, are those that generation of fighters. And then that next generation was a little bit better athletes and a little bit more educated and a little less of that, but still plenty of it. Plenty of that kind of uh, rock star mentality. Uh, I want to, I'll put it that way. That's a great way to think it. Just a rock star mentality. This new generation is much more, they're still super tough, but they're much more like in tune with mental illness. They understand more about anxiety and all like stuff that you would be like, Oh man, are you nervous? And, and the old, old, yeah, I'm nervous. No, I'm never nervous. Yeah, exactly. I'm go, I'm <laughs> nervous. I'm going to whoop his ass too as, hard. As your I'm hand's gonna, doing this. <laughs> right, exactly. This generation is like, I really actually respect it. They're like, hell yeah, I'm nervous. I'm still going to do it, but I'm nervous. Yep. Like, they're just much more honest about a lot of their emotional stuff, and they're much more educated about it. Um, but you can't call them at 3 a.m. for to go to your like they'd be like what what do you want me to do coach coach i don't feel that's appropriate I, you know what i mean it's much more of a <laughs> so you're you're like you're you're shifting kind of out of which i think is for the benefit and just the athletes are so much better now i mean they're really that second like your generation josh i think when the athletes really started coming in like they yeah Oh those, no no! Those, Josh was definitely not in the better ass generation. So. Let's just just be honest. He was. Just, yeah. This guy, this but guy. Uh, I, I, you get no respect around here, man. I'm like the Rodney right. Dangerfield. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he definitely was, but like that that level, and and each I think each generation could go back and and do well against the previous generation, as you do when you're basically we are where we are because we're standing on the shoulders of people that put their blood, sweat, and tears in there, right? I mean. Where I was when I first started MMA and where the Gracie family was, I mean, I always say it. They were like PhDs and I was in kindergarten and that's the truth. Like those guys were amazing. No one knew anything. They're arm barring people and choking dudes out left and right. I know it happened to me. I was pissed <laughs> off. That's why so, I started. Yeah. So all, all those guys, muscles didn't help them get out. That's for sure. No, nope, it didn't. <laughs> Um, so you had that. And then it kind of like hit this, that, this place where we were for a long time where – well, if we can sprawl and brawl, you know what I mean? And now it's mm-hmm. everybody does everything. Everybody does everything. It's the days of, I mean, you can have a root sport. He came from wrestling or whatever, but everybody has to do it all. I'm going to hit you with a hard question here. Because, well, you know, I, I could go into a couple. You just had, I gave you a phone call. Uh, let's say now it was 20 years ago. And I said, Greg, hey, man, do you have a a, f- a female fighter somewhere in the area of a hundred pounds that would want to do this thing called bully beat down. Oh yeah. You said, I got a girl, the karate hottie, man. Yeah. You, you sent me Michelle Watterson. Well, Mich- well, Michelle Watterson just retired. Yes. So my first question is, what is that like for you to spend that entire career? She spent her entire career with you and you see her go through all these evolutions and finally gets to the point of retirement. And then you also had Diego Sanchez. And, and one of the things I'm going to, I want you to, explain and talk about is when you see it and it was one of the things that i had problems with being a referee i see that you know fighter when they're young and i see them when they're in the middle of their career and then i see them near the end and i see them being different how do you handle that that's a good question so uh first with the michelle thing uh that that was bittersweet like just having she she came down from denver uh with cowboy of all people with donald I, uh, they kind of came down, she came down maybe a couple months after him. Um, and it's just always been the sweetest, most wonderful person. She's just wonder. We all love her. Um, but it was like what MMA did for her. I think not just personally, but like she can do movies now she's doing all this stuff. So I was actually really happy to see her retire. Cause I know she's going to be moving into better things. Mm-hmm. Some people, when they retire, I like Diego, when he retires, I'm, I'm going to be really worried about him. You know what I mean? Cause I'm, I want Diego to move into better things as well. Um, but I know peanut, that's what we call Michelle, uh, is going to move into 
movie. She married Josh. He's a great guy. They have businesses together. It's, it's, uh, you know, it, it her, she's going to have a happy, happy ever after story. Um, so I wasn't too sad on her retirement just because I know she's going to be happy. And that's the most important thing. Um, with Diego, I, I, I worry he's so passionate. Like Diego has the biggest heart you've ever met. Yeah. And he really wants to believe like that's his thing is that he wants he's since he was a kid, he just wants to believe so bad. Um, and so I think that that big heart and his want to believe leads him into places where he shouldn't be. And like with his last coach and that kind of stuff, um, it, it doesn't come from a malicious place with Diego. It comes from his his big heart and him wanting to be a part of something special and 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 really he loves the camaraderie of it. You know what I mean? And, and having guys that care about him and stuff. And so you, you, you can get misled on that. And, and I think right. Diego misled several times. You, um, you brought up guys when you said like, Hey, the, the generation before goes with the generation after that generation compete still with the generation that came after them. But I'm going to go back and Kenny Florian asked me this question when I was on the Anik and Florian podcast, uh, two weeks ago, then Kenny came on. I asked him the same question. But let me ask you that same question. Could guys like John Jones, GSP, Carlos Conant, Holly Holm, and you know Rashad Evans, could that could they in their prime compete with this generation now? Oh yeah, absolutely. The, with them, it's really uh, an information thing. If they had the current information, they could. Um, if you like put them in a time capsule and brought them over, they might have a harder time with some of the nuanced stuff that we're doing these days. Yeah, but I. Uh, Overall, yeah, I, I think that the, those guys are just great. You know what I mean? And that's just not from my school. Any Anderson, yeah. you, any of those guys from that generation would do fine at it. Again, it was it, it's a mentality shift. And honestly, if you brought in some of the old guys, there were some great athletes like back in the old. Don Fry was a great athlete. Like, he really was. Uh, Coleman, Randleman, oh, yeah. those were great athletes. They really are. Um, Man, it was a special. Spe spe yeah, good lord, uh, Boss Rutten. Like those guys mm -hmm. are great. Boss Rutten could do like one arm pull ups in a day and stuff, as big as he was. So uh, you know, some of those he was guys never big. Yeah, you know, it's funny because people think your boss is big. He's not, but man, yeah. he was physically strong. incredibly strong. He well, kicked me one time, and I thought I, I he just broke my leg. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's like I he love. He was that. he was incredible. Yeah, I love him to death. Uh, so, yes, I, I think that if you had certain guys, but remember, those are the majority of the guys doing MMA back then. Those were the guys that you on TV. They only had two or three fights. Like, the rest of them were not those guys. Um, yeah. Some of them were, but they, uh, so those guys, no. They were just, like I said, they were just, they had to fight. There was nothing else they could do. There was a, the demons were talking in their brain, and they, it, it had to come out that way. Uh, either that or heavy drugs. Like, I don't know what other way they would have been all right. Uh, so, yeah, that, that generation. But I think that, like, when you're talking the, the, the cream of the cream in any, any of those generations, they could all compete. You just brought out something that I wanted to ask you about was because I was talking with a, a couple managers, but one of them specifically had said something to me. He's like, you know, we were talking to a fighter about, you know, being, becoming a fighter, uh, kid wrestling, you know, coming out of college. And the, the talk, I guess, on MMA guys is that as I got to talk to him, yeah, he kind of comes from a broken home. He's not in, and he's this, he's that. There's always something wrong, it seems like, with an MMA fighter. They've got their inner demons. It doesn't matter this generation or the beginning generation. That's right. And he's like, oh, yeah, he's got, he's got some problems at home. He came from, comes from a broken family. He'll be just fine. That was the comments made. <laughs> like, he'll be just fine. Like, <laughs> I mean, have you noticed that? That, like, MMA guys and females, they have a tendency to come from broken homes, but doesn't mean that they're not educated and smart. We know a lot of them that have, you know, their degrees. Majority of them actually have their degrees. They did this after, you know, college. Uh, but what, what's your take on that? Well, I think that you like to get into a cage and fight another human being mm -hmm. isn't normal. Like it, it, it is to guys like you'd be like, even guys what? Probably, be like, what do you mean it's not normal, Greg? It, yeah. There's only there's only you know a couple of hundred of us doing it right out of the yeah. population, so you're going to need some kind of impetus. Now some people just love it. Like there are a few guys that are from great families, the great you know great. They just love fighting, but I think that's extremely rare. I think that most of it comes from some kind of what I always call a pebble in your shoe, some kind of discomfort, some kind of 
I mean, and, and you see degrees of that. There's people like that I grew up with, certainly like Johnny Tapia, um, that that the yeah, only demons. place I think that guy was happy was fighting. Like, yeah, I knew him when I was a kid. He was a little older than I was. But like that, that seemed to me the only time he was happy. I mean, he loved it. He would be in there and just he's smiling and laughing and joking with the guy and just banging. And I just loved it. He loved fighting. Um, I, I think that there are certain things that when you, when you have to deal with early life, especially early life, that gets your brain kind of moving. And if it's in a negative way, sometimes the only thing that you can do to not live in those negative spaces is to have something as important as that. I think that they also make good soldiers as well mm-hmm. because it focus, right? Like our ADD brains are all over the place. It's very hard for us to be at work on time and sit in front of a computer and do all these things, right? That's not, that's a challenge for, for a lot of fighters. So I think that like the martial arts or fighting in general, like when someone's trying to knock you out, you have to focus there mm-hmm. and you, and everything else kind of goes away. So the demons aren't really talking to you during that process. And then I think the other thing is you get value from it. Other people say, Oh, you're that fighter. You know what I mean? That you get recognition, you get respect, because really, to me, what I learned in my young life is like that Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That's a bunch of shit. Like all of that is forget that. Like even before food and water is respect, because if you don't have respect, somebody will come and take your food and water. Your food and water. Mm. There you go. But like that, so like that, the, everything is respect driven. Everything is respect driven for humans. Everything. And you can like, well, no, 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 like if you look hard enough, it's respect driven. Um, if you look at like right people that write about being in the gulags in in Russia it, it, during the Stalinistic times, man, like you really you you read like that's the bottom line of humanity. That's the the very bottom, and still respect is what rules that game. Mm. Um, and so, like I, I think that fighters get that very human need from there because you're not going to get respect from the people that are abusing you or the situations that are abusing you. Um, so you're looking for that respect somewhere else and you're looking for it pretty hard if you're brave and you, and you, uh, you feel you need that. And so I think fighters, in my opinion, it keeps the demons from talking and then it gives you that respect element because we get, I mean, not just fighters, but you get wacky people in martial arts. I mean, wacky people. <laughs> I remember early on, I mean, phonies. I, I had a guy come into my school who wanted to keep a free, as is a true story, freezer of baboon blood. I said, a freezer of baboon blood? What the? And he goes, no, no, in case I need a transfusion if I'm bleeding during practice or something. So obviously a very mentally ill individual, yeah. but all into the martial arts, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. I've had those. Baboon we all blood. have. Baboon blood. I, I had a guy one time, he cried, his name was Modi, and he came in, and, and I'm looking at his hands, and his knuckles are absolutely destroyed. Giant, gnarly, big old. And I, and I go, what have you been doing with your hands? He says, Oh, I, I hit steel. And I go, why? <laughs> he goes, cause he says, cause my hands are like steel now. He goes, and he looks, I have you know, a boxing ring, you know, and it's got the four inch post there. And he says, he goes, he goes, if I hit that, he says, I could break those steel posts. I said, please do. I want to watch. <laughs> right. He goes, no, oh, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. I said, no, 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 no. I want you to <laughs> go break that post, please. That's right. I go, I want to see you do something that no one's ever been able to do. Hmm. Please do it. Right. Uh, he, he ended up you know, trying out for you know, the fight team that we had. He didn't make it at the time because the only thing that was gnarled besides his brain was his knuckles. There you go. But, <laughs> right. Greg, that's same weirdness. That's Weird. it. You know, one of the things that, you know, people don't understand as far they, they think everything is glamorous to be a fighter is glamorous, which most of the time it's not. They think being the trainer is glamorous because God, you get to be around these people and it's not. But one of the things, you know, that I was lucky enough to do, you know, I would work somewhere in the area, about 120 shows a year, you know, which is hard to explain to people because they're like, well, there's only 52 weeks. But in those 120 shows, I would see you at 80 of them at least. Yeah. Okay. And you were always on the planes, always in the airports, you know, that I was in and always going somewhere for another fight. What are you doing in, in the transition here? I know you're slowing down a little bit. You're trying to cut back on what you used to do because you were always away from home. What is, what's the difference between those days and what you're doing now? Now it's much nicer because <laughs> I, I, so I'll train. I still go to the gym. You know, I, I do about 10 classes a week. So about 40 classes a month. Um, and 
I do a little individual stuff too as well, but I'm not working with the same amount of fighters that I am. I still work with most of them, but not to the same level. But the real deal is the travel, as you know. Like I just, I'm home on the weekends. Like I'll go and I'll wake up and I go in my backyard and I weed a little bit and I play with my dogs and then I'll read a book and I play video games and I hang out with my wife, who's amazing. And it's just... <laughs> Dude, I'm like, oh, who I just met nice. again, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, this is wonderful. Um, and you know, I talk to my kids. One of my kids is in Chicago. The other's in Rhode Island, and so I we go visit. They'll come here. Yada yada yada. It's it's just nice. It's the the whole thing is is very nice. And I still I don't think I can ever retire all the way because I still love the martial arts so much. I still love training fighters so much and helping people. It really it really makes me happy. Um, but not being on an airplane every week has made all the difference. And then just the, the stress of cornering, you know, again, because like John said, there's only so many weeks. But for every card, I'd have three or four guys at least. And some of the old King of the Cage days, I'd have the entire card. I'd have like, oh, oh, dude, those are horrible. Yeah. It was a long night. So um, the, mo the most fights I ever did in one night, King of the Cage, 23. Yep. 23, <laughs> 23 fights. 23 fights. Like, that's ridiculous. That's that no, is that's ridiculous. no one. Yeah, look, I love fights. I love fights as much as anyone I think I know, and I don't want to watch 23 fights. <laughs> no, no, It's no. all right. I, I worked for Bellator during that time. We were doing 23, 22 oh, fights. Oh, yeah. I was like, oh, man, this is rough. And then yeah. in another country, too, so you're doing it at like mint. You know, your, your fights are starting at, say, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night. You don't get done until 2 in the morning. Nothing's so open after. You're like, oh, this is what? <laughs> yeah. um, I guess for me, my last question is this, is – do you miss kind of the original times, the old times? Do you look back at your gym and go, man, I had, I had, you know, whether the younger, you know, GSP and John, do you miss the, the go, the, those times? Or do you think the joy of such, in your days? Yeah. yeah. Or, or, <laughs> Cause you know, there's a lot of history there. You know, we, we call them the good old days for a reason, because that saying is like, Hey, it, it kind of brings back memories of the good old days, but the I'm, new days ahead. What are you excited about? I miss the people sometimes. Like I don't get to see those guys all the time. And so yeah. I miss seeing them, you know, like that, that's, I think the part I miss the most is just seeing them. But the good old days, like we were just talking about, like, I don't miss being on an airplane. I yeah. don't, I don't, there's a lot. I don't miss about it. Um, like having to get the three o'clock uh, calls in the morning because one of my Russian fighters doesn't really understand how to drive and uh, blue. <laughs> so, Coach, big problem, big problem. And yeah. beyond, I'm like, I'm sorry, please don't take him to jail. You can give him tickets. In, in Russia, red lights are more of a suggestion than a... <laughs> anyway, like, so those days I don't miss. But I do miss, like, they would just make me laugh. Like, Rashad Evans is one of the funniest human beings. One time we were all driving to Colorado. It was uh, in the car was Holly, Joey, Via Senor, Rashad was Keith there a couple of guys anyway I hit black ice we're on our way to Colorado to go train with uh, Trevor Whitman hit black ice so I'm doing a couple of 360s on I-25 well, luckily we hit a hit a, a little thing instead of going off the side of the mountain and Rashad like was asleep we woke up spinning car is dead quiet and Rashad goes I almost woke up dead <laughs> <laughs> little stuff like that like it, yeah. The time that George thought he saw aliens and was you know, like just there's so many funny as you guys had in, in AKA and yeah. Big John, I like Big John used to hide the, the gloves from me when <laughs> we seen each other so many times that I would go backstage and then I would have to find the MMA gloves because John had hidden them somewhere in the which is super fun and hilarious. Like yeah, th yeah. those days that those things I miss, like that kind of stuff I miss, but there's so much that I don't miss that I'm okay with it. I'm at peace with not having to do that over and over. Makes sense. Was, you know, one of the things that one of my fond memories was the first time that I, uh, I was going to referee Donald Cerrone and, you know, and I watched Donald forever before and you were coaching him. Right. And, and I go in the back to, to talk to him and he's pacing back and forth and he's a mess. And this is a guy that I've, you know, you know, I'll fight next week. I'll fight tomorrow. I'll <laughs> fight. In. And then I go, and I'm like, did you, I said, Greg, is he gonna be okay? Right? And you go, oh yeah, this is this is Norm. He'll be fine as soon as he walks out the door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay, yeah. we're good, good to go. Let me tell. I'm gonna tell a John story. So I get to the UFC in what year? 2004, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, nobody knows who I am. Thank God. And I, 
but I'm like, I like, I know everybody, obviously it's my sport. So I'm like, oh, no. and then I'm like, oh man, that's big John. Like, is it already a legend, right? Like, is he refereed everything? And yeah. so, and then big John goes, Hey, you're really popular uh, these days. Oh, Greg's the first thing he ever said to me. And I go, uh. I go, he's not talking to me. So I literally look over my shoulder. Like, is there somebody, you know what I mean? You don't want to be the guy that's like, <laughs> yeah, I, thank you, John. But then yeah, he wasn't me. talking to you at all in the first place. So I have that like so moment weird. where I'm like, my heart dropped. I was like, oh, there's somebody behind me. And he goes, wait, no, he said Greg. Nope. Nope. And then I said, so I didn't even know how he knew who I was at that point. <laughs> I, I was like, uh, th thank you very much. And then, and I was on cloud boy. You don't want to hang out with me for that week. I was like, yeah, big John knows who I am. You had totally low expectations, man. No, <laughs> no, no. And then I, it was a story that I told everybody. And then again, like my life is is nonviolent Quakers, right? I was raised by nonviolent Quakers, so they could give two shits about anything. Like I would come home and be like, "Hey, Big John, know who I was?" And they'd be like, well, "Who's Big John?" Awesome. Good, good for him. <laughs> good for you. <laughs> but for me in my world, that was uh, that was it. I, that was uh, that was one of the high points. Hey, man, I want to thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. And uh, I guess one last thing. Who in your gym that is coming up, who should we keep an eye out for? Well, you always got to keep an eye out, and your favorite guy is Mr. Aaron Pico. He's, I love the kid. Uh, looks like he's fighting for the title here at the end of the year, so uh, keep your eye on him. We got a ton of, uh, of up-and-comers who I'm not going to name. Yeah, I never name them because as soon as I do, I forgot one of them. They will all watch this, and they will <laughs> nice. like, Coach, you, you don't think I have it? You don't, they yeah. literally. Oh, man. <laughs> like, Fighters no, have the weakest feelings, right? Yeah. <laughs> the feelings oh always get hurt. Dude, it's, it's, I always used to say it's like having a hundred girlfriends that I can't have sex with. That is what <laughs> my team is. If Very you get nice. all the drama of a relationship, uh, and then you, but you get none of the benefits. A lot of high maintenance. I like that. Oh, yeah. Greg, I want to tell you, hey, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for everything you've done for the sport of MMA. You have always been a great ambassador. You're a class act. You are known as Yoda, not because of your ears. It's because of what's between those ears that makes <laughs> you special. Thank, thank you so much for coming on, and uh, best of luck to you with thank your future fights, everything that's going out. Just keep, keep trucking there, my friend. Will do. Thank you guys. And you two can't thank me for being an ambassador to mixed martial arts. You guys do more than I ever have. So you thank you guys for being the awesome ambassadors of mixed martial arts. Thanks, brother. We'll talk you soon. take care, my man. Hey guys, bye.